is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Trickster Drift, chapters 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22. Hole. Oh, full of scorpions is my mind. Spook. Someone I used to love. And the sartorial resistance. In these chapters, Jared is actually kind of starting to put down some roots here. Just a little bit. I'm feeling very optimistic, but also I'm going to need him to start addressing that there is a thing in his room and a zombie child downstairs. He still is in such denial. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. So, obviously, you can hear that I sound a little weird. I'm getting over a pretty bad illness um, in which I had lost my voice entirely. This is my first day back. I was very excited when I woke up and my voice appeared to be back. It seems like it's mostly back, and I will, when I'm talking, occasionally drop the last syllable of each word, depending on like how dry. I get. So uh, forgive me if I take a break here and there to have a sip of my orange juice to wet my whistle and get things going again. It doesn't necessarily work, but hey, forever, right? So these chapters, I'm really digging this book. I think a lot of it is because, like I said last time, uh, it's so much more focused on him and also, I think there's a certain bit of like comfort that comes to me from the fact that he is being supported now. And so this is more fun to read simply because things are going better for him. And I just really want that. You know, Jared is a good kid. Jared is the kind of, of person who really tries to do and say the right thing. And I don't mean that in terms of like, <clears throat> what's going to make people like him. I mean, in terms of what is going to be the right thing in the end. Like he often puts what is best for him second. And that's a rare thing. And I feel like he just hasn't gotten any sort of reward for that. And that's totally like a legitimate way to tell the story. It's not like most people do get rewards for doing the right thing. Honestly, we want to pretend that we do. And it's a lovely thought, but we have to be willing as people to do the right thing for the sake of it, rather than because we get any sort of reward. And not all of us are able to get into that headspace, myself included. And he is, and I just respect that a lot. You know, I just, Jared is the kind of um, character that does the things that you want characters to do. Like he says and asks things that you always get irritated when you're reading a book because Another character does not ask the questions that you think should be asked or, you know, doesn't seem to come to the conclusions that you would come to. And I will put an asterisk by this and say, I'm saying all of this quite aside from how he is behaving, re this ghost, because I got to be honest, still mad about it. But this whole thing with how he has taken on a new job, like in this section, he gets a job at this donut place and it's a like fucking third shift, like brutal kind of job. It's, this is somebody who is really wanting to do his part and be on his feet. He goes and gets this job. He comes home. 
He makes a pot of chili. He roasts two turkeys. He goes to school. You know, like, there are, there are so many people out here in this world who live this kind of life and they get no recognition or thanks for it. And I don't, again, to a degree, you just got to do what you got to do. But he's a kid, you know, he's still 17 and he has a sense of responsibility to him that just fucking full grown adults don't even have, especially the adults that have been in his life. So I'm just really liking, I'm enjoying reading this book more than the first, because even though there are still a lot of struggles that he's up against in a lot of ways, his life, <clears throat> you hear me, you hear me losing this word in a lot of ways, his life seems a lot less bleak than it did in the previous book. Um, so yeah, I am just, I just wanted to start off with that. And this chapter, so the first chapter starts off with him going to school and, uh, getting a message back from his grandma and telling him that she's like, you know, uh, glad that he liked the Vespa. It just seemed like a, a waste to leave it in the garage garage. <clears throat> and he thinks to himself about whether or not he should like ask her for money and knows that that would kill the relationship. But also he's worried that like, maybe he should kill the relationship because his mom keeps warning him about Sophia. Um, and he's kind of thinking maybe she has a point that he just doesn't know about because he's starting to listen to his mom a little bit more about what he doesn't know. Basically he's, he seems to be aware of the fact finally that maybe she has some knowledge of shit that he doesn't. And I really am glad that he reaches out to her later for instructions on something to do to guard to guard his room, to guard the house, but his room specifically, you know, the whole place. Um, it's just that he doesn't get a straight answer from her, from her yet, because it turns out that Richie's brother was shot. And we'll get into all of that a little bit later. Um, but he says to himself, as he's thinking about what to do about Sophia, um, YOLO, Jared thought, he'd done the things he'd done. You learned and you moved on. Or you lied to yourself and kept repeating the same old, same old. He had a hard time distinguishing between the two. They sounded a lot alike in his head. The balcony was one of Jared's favorite places in the apartment, even on rainy, miserable days like this one. So I really like this because... This is a place that he can get out of the friggin' house. Like he can still be somewhere safe with people who care about him. But I'm hoping that the balcony is like kind of an escape from <clears throat> whatever this nexus is that's in the house. Um, and he's kind of keeping an eye out for David while he's out there. And as he's sitting there, he's thinking about repainting all of the patio furniture. And this is just the kind of kid he is. You know, like most kids would just be like, oh, this furniture sucks, huh, whatever. And he is, oh, I could fix this. I could come out here and get a grinder and redo the whole thing. Like, he's just, he's unusual, you know. Um, so he texts his mom uh, asking for the help. And she, this is before she, because like she doesn't tell him that what to do. She says that she's going to come down with Richie and that's what winds up putting the, uh, delay on everything. It wasn't that she was just going to text him instructions. She was going to actually come over and show him what to do. But because everything is going down with his family, it winds up just ruining the whole plan. I'm very curious about now. This is my my paranoia coming out, I guess. 
because she says that there was like a magical fight and that that's what resulted in Richie's brother getting killed. I can't help but wonder if somebody didn't purposely do something to keep his mom from joining him and getting these wards set up. I don't think that's the case. I think I'm probably overthinking it all. But as of right now, I'm just kind of like ready to think the worst of everything and everyone. Um, so we go to him going through the freezer and the fridge and cooking a bunch of stuff. He makes this huge pot of chili. Um, and the ghost is here, a uh, bathrobe. And he is very disdainful of the fact that Jared is having problems with his physics homework. Later on, this leads to an agreement between the two of them that he will assist Jared with his school, uh, with his schoolwork, physics, as well as biology. If Jared will turn on the TV and let him watch and I was really glad that Jared finally comes to this arrangement because it seems pretty clear that everything he's doing to get rid of this guy isn't working and he may as well get something out of it because obviously bathrobe knows what he's doing, RE science. So, you know, I mean, just, yeah, fucking take advantage. You've got to, and the only thing I'm concerned about is his aunt, like he's keeping it a secret from her that there's a ghost in the house and he has to find a way to turn the television on for this guy. But he had promised her that he would find a way to fix the TV from turning on by itself all the time. And I feel like Jared should really come clean to his aunt and just tell her what the fuck is happening. I will be honest. I have absolutely no idea what her reaction would be. I just, don't like, I, I don't know her well enough to be able to guess what she, if she, if she believes enough to believe him, if she'll think he's crazy or if maybe the fact that like Edgar was saying some of the same shit that he's going to be saying will be enough to convince her after all, I'm, I really don't know, but I want so much for this to be like a weird sitcom with a ghost where she's aware that he's there, but doesn't like, can't see him and has to talk to him through Jared. Like, I'm just really curious about it all. What could happen if she, if he tells her, um, cause I feel like she has enough of a connection with like native roots and stuff with the people in the community and uh, Barbie with her, you know, dance and song stuff downstairs. It might not be completely out of the realm of possibility that she would believe him and listen to him. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so justice comes by. And I don't remember if I mentioned that justice, I think, is trans. I think I did mention that. But I didn't really like address how cool it is that the that I'm pretty sure Justice is a trans character and it's not like dwelt on at all. She's just she's just there. Uh, author calls her by her correct pronouns. Everybody is cool about it. And it's not this big issue. Very happy about it. Um, so Justice comes by and is saying how like grateful she is for him helping out Maeve with all of her stuff. He tries to act like it's nothing, but she's like, listen, you keep cooking. You put together all of her bookshelves. Like, no, you've been doing kind of a lot. And she asked for his help bringing this like huge storage locker into the house at some point. Um, and when he asks something about bracing it, she says, oh, you sound like Hank. And he's like, shut up. And she says, he, he grows on you. And Jared is still not believing this. I don't blame him. Hank has not done a lot to recommend himself. The only reason 
that I'm not like actively angry at Hank all the time is simply because everybody else around Jared right now seems to be people of decent judgment and they're all okay with Hank. So I'm basically trusting Hank based on his like references rather than himself as a person. And I want him to like prove to me that I'm wrong and be better, but he's not doing much in that regard. Like he comes busting into the house later on within these chapters and is really rude and just like, he's just domineering, you know, I just, I don't like it. Um, so he's laying in bed and he's like avoiding going running because he's afraid to run into David. He's texting Sarah, trying to figure out where she is. She's not replying. And here comes this thing. Ah, oh, you guys. The corner of the room darkened. All the painted heads on the wall blinked at the same time, then turned to stare at the corner. They mouthed words Jared couldn't hear. His body felt heavy, as if he'd swum a long way in the ocean and was trying to pull himself out. He had an urge to hide under the quilt like a kid, but he couldn't. The stain, a dark gray shadow, took the shape of a bony arm. The fingers tapped the wall, as if testing for a weak spot. The heads vibrated, blurring. What? So at this point, Maeve comes in and interrupts the whole thing. The shadow retreats, the heads stop moving. But then when she leaves... A black dot was on the wall. He had no desire to touch it, so he went and got a ruler from the desk. He scraped at the wall, but the black dot didn't budge. It shivered. He leapt back. The painted faces all frowned at the same time. A thing in the wall poked a finger through the dot. The warding really hadn't worked. Jared watched the shadow finger wiggling like a worm. He picked up a bundle of cedar branches from the other corner of the room and placed it over the black dot. The shadow shivered, then pulled back from the wall. Jared went to the junk drawer for a hammer, banged in a small nail, and hung the cedar branches over the dot. The painted face nearest to him tumbled happily, <laughs> tumbled happily, smiling and winking. Can you talk? Jared said. They remained silent, but as he stood there, he felt a wave of warmth, like seeing someone you love, a pleasant afterglow. They liked him, he thought. They wanted him to know he was welcome here. Then the faces on the wall went still. So, there's something trying to get through, and these faces are guardians, somehow, and... I'm really, like, I have to say, if you try and tell me that these disembodied heads painted on the wall are going to be on his side and are going to be, if basically, that I'm going to think they're good guys, I'm not really going to believe you, to be honest. Because I am assuming a disembodied head is terrifying and creepy. And I just cannot have good associations with that. Disembodied heads, historically, in fiction, the trope, that's been a bad thing. It's been negative. Uh, but this description of them, like, sending out a warm glow... And laughing and tumbling happily. I don't know. I'm 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 going to believe that they are good. I'm going to take it at face value. It's the kind of thing that's like, am I getting lured into a false sense of security? I don't want to think that. I want him to just like. 
I feel about the, the supernatural aspect of these books the same way that I do about his personal life, which is that I just want good things. I just want people on his side. And I am a little too willing to accept supernatural help from these creatures that I don't know of because there doesn't seem to be a good other option. Um, but it does seem like they are actually on his side and like guarding him against whatever this thing is. I wish to God we could find out whatever this thing is though. I want to know. I'm very concerned about it. A long bony finger poking out of like a little, a little black dot. Don't like it. So later he's sitting out on the balcony and Cedar comes by. Cedar is the little wolf boy and Cedar can communicate just via thinking and is standing outside and says, you made granny cry. You're mean. I don't like you. And Jared correctly deduces that Cedar is not supposed to be over here all by himself. And basically like mentally connects with Cedar's mom and tells her where her son is. And he goes running, but this is what gives Georgina information about where he lives. So she is able to send him something later on. Now, I think this is the sweetest thing and I really appreciate it. I'm so sorry, you guys. I really appreciated that he seems to actually accept what she sent him. I was a little worried that because of who it's coming from, he would be really obstinate about it. But the fact that she remembered and cared enough to do this means a lot to him. And despite the way that they left things... Uh, it's a, you know, it's a big deal. So she sends him a big book, which is, that's the book for Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's full of like how, how to do the steps as well as stories from people who have done them. And I am really touched that she got him a one year chip because I mentioned, I think it's one of the first chapters that he realizes it's been a year, but he's in an unfamiliar place and he'd have to go to like a new meeting with a bunch of people that he doesn't know and get a chip from people that don't mean anything to him. And that for him getting that chip would just not mean as much. And this getting sent a chip by somebody who brought you to your first meeting, having them like keep track of that. And she also sends him a thousand dollars in cash and tells him she understands if he doesn't feel comfortable accepting it. But if he doesn't to give it to somebody who can use it and he decides to take it and of course, because this is who he is, the first thing he does is pays back Maeve for the money that she spent on his textbooks, which, listen, I really deeply understand why he did that. I'm not even going to say that I wouldn't have done the same thing because I view owing my friends money in a much more serious light than I view owing anybody, you know, like utilities money. It's not a smart way to be. I should care a lot more about whether my electricity is going to get shut off than whether my friend's mad at me, but I will pay my friends back first. So I get it. But at the same time, he still hasn't gotten his student loan to come through. And I'm starting to get worried, guys. I might be wrong. 
is that money ever going to come through? Because I'm kind of worried that it's going to turn out either it's not going to come through and he's going to have to quit school or something awful or that like David fucked it up for him because David keeps on insisting he's going to get back at him. But I don't see David being able to physically corner Jared. He's always got people around him. And that's something that could really fuck the kid's life up. But I don't know how Jared would or how David would even go about doing something like that. You know, so I don't know. Um, I'm just the the main thing for me is I want Jared to wait to pay people back until he is in a more stable place, period. I really get the impulse to pay back as soon as you can. And that's respectable. And it's not the wrong thing to do, but I'm not sure it's the smart thing to do. And I don't think Maeve would care, you know, but he is who he is. So, of course, he pays her back immediately. Um, so this is when Jared gets this job working at the donut place. Uh, he has to go in through the back. Like he, the guy doesn't want him coming through the front. The guy also, like, wants to pay him under the table in cash. Um, and I'm, like, sort of suspicious about what this means. There's just a lot about what's going well for Jared that the first book has programmed me to be suspicious of. Um, and also, Jared took the very first job that he got offered. But I don't know that's a good idea. I wish that he had applied to a couple other places because he is a smart kid who does work hard and is reliable and he could do better than this. But maybe he likes getting paid under the table. I don't know. It's just that this isn't going to count towards, like, his... It, I don't know that he could write this place, for example, on a resume because it's under the table. Like, the guy might not admit that Jared even worked for him. I'm thinking too far in advance, but still. That's how I think. Um, so... He gets offered a job by Maeve. Uh, we have a stock boy position at Sartorial Resistance. Um, and he says no. He doesn't. He thinks it's charity, you know, like her giving him a job. And it's just, she'd be lucky to have you, dude. It's fine. Uh, <clears throat> so he finally gets a message from Sarah. Um, cause he had texted her telling her your mom came by, she's really worried about you. And Sarah's basically like, you fucking sucker. Mom is just messing with you. She hates you. And I'm not telling you where I am cause I know that you can't keep a secret. And she asks, you ready to fly? <clears throat> oh my God, this is killing me guys. She texts back. You ready to fly the friendly skies? Get high and use magic, she meant. Trip with each other. Travel to worlds where ape men and fireflies ruled. You know the answer, Jared wrote. We're on different paths, Nickelback. Tired of everyone telling me what I should think. Found a witch who's willing to teach me. Oh, really? What the fuck? Who? Excuse me? I am dying to know. Um, so, the next day, Jared gets some messages from David. Photos of him traveling to the donut hole. And uh, it's in the middle of the night. Just to emphasize that when you walk to work, I'm watching you. Um... And he considers putting them on Facebook and decides not to, but I really wish he would. I just document everything, you know? Um, and this whole, like, this whole subplot here 
with uh, Coda being drunk is such a bummer. I appreciate it because Jared honestly is incredibly unusual. He has managed to be sober for a year. First try. That's a big deal. That's almost unheard of, you know, like, and Coda is a much more honest example. I shouldn't use the word honest because it's making me sound like I'm accusing this author of being dishonest with Jared. And I'm not, that's not what I mean. But Coda is a much more realistic average person example of what it means. And he has tried like six times. I think he said, um, I'm trying to find exactly where the point is. He says how many times day fucking one, one more goddamn motherfucking time. Uh, he says later, I think, because he mentions that he wants to make a necklace out of all of his day, day one chips. Um, but they go to the meeting and they're talking to another young girl. Um, she is dressed pretty young. They don't say how young she is, but because Coda later accuses Jared of flirting with her, I'm going to assume that she's like 25. Um, her name was Lex and this was her day one this year, third day one this year. Her poison was anything she could get her hands on. She'd gotten up to day 60, but her friends kept calling and being sober was boring. They all sounded like they were having a blast. And so she went with them and in her mind, she was going to just have sober fun, but she felt left out. And what the hell, you know, there's a couple of youth meetings around. Jared said, maybe you need sober friends who do stuff. She smirked like hiking and shit. Pfft, fuck that. Um, which, honestly, that's the thing. When you get together with people who drink, the drinking is the activity. It's really rare that you're actually doing something and drinking on the side. The drinking's usually the main event, and whatever you're doing, you're doing on the side. Um... So if you go and you're not going to drink with everybody, you're just standing there watching everybody else get drunk and act more and more stupid. So, yeah, being friends with people who aren't sober, when you're trying to be sober, it really does leave you with fewer options. And if all of your social like get-togethers had been to drink, and then you get together with people who don't drink, you have to find an activity to do together. I think that's why a lot of sober people, um, especially my father, they get into eating sugar. Um, my dad was big into cookies. And uh, I have a couple friends who got very into board games. Also, my mother, who is sober, um, she has found a lot of help with doing uh, adult coloring books because it keeps your hands busy and keeps your mind focused. And that seems to be some, but like, you know, that's all the kind of thing that if you're a young kid, that sounds so boring. You know, people are going out partying, having these wild times. And yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with my adult coloring book. Like get the fuck out of here. Um, so, okay. <laughs> um, I'm kind of wondering if I should, let me see what time the next Trickster Drift episode is booked for. Because my voice is going so crazy that I'm wondering if I should do extra time on the next one. Um, it won't be until a couple weeks from now. So I think, guys, it's probably best... If I cut this one off early, um, this is just going to be the start of chapter 19. Um, but I'm like worried that I'm not going to be able to make it to the end of this 
or that it's just really a bummer for you guys to listen to me talk when I'm talking like this. Um, as I'm trying to see the next episode, and I don't see one coming up soon, um, but I think that might be best. Let me just finish this talking about this real quick. Um, we have this moment where Coda and and Jared go to a cafe afterwards. And Coda, like, he was, he showed up wasted. He's still drunk during the meeting. He's throwing up after the meeting. And he seems really, like, resentful towards Jared for being able to do this so easily. And he's also, he says something about how I used to make 20 grand every four months. And I guess he used to deal drugs. I'm guessing. I'm not positive. He doesn't really get into it. But based on the fact that Jared responds to this story later with, well, you know, I used to bake and I made, I made pretty good money doing that. I think that's Jared comparing like, yeah, when you're not sober, you can do all kinds of sketchy shit. Um, and Coda says, are you even a booze hound? Like, how could you do it so easily? And Jared basically says, dude, I literally almost died. Like, sincerely, nearly dead. If I get drunk again, I think that'll be it. I think I'll die. And so I don't have another recovery in me. Um, so Coda th vomits again lights a cigarette. He's smoking and like throwing up. It's real bad. Um, I can't deal with Hank right now. Coda said, my couch is your couch. Jared said. So Coda goes, sleeps it off a bit, takes a shower. The ghost is in here walking around while Jared's in the shower. And when fucking what's his face comes busting in here. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, here it is. He, I thought that he busted in here now, but it's a little bit later. Hank comes in. Um, they sat on the balcony watching the street. Their silence was comfortable. Coda closed his eyes and sighed. Jared remembered his first sober days the open sore, rawness of everything, the heart pounding, throat aching, stomach churning need, listening to his mom's party raging on all around him. He'd curled up in bed like he was adrift in a lifeboat, dying of thirst, surrounded by an ocean. Um, so Coda takes 20 bucks from him, goes to get cigarettes, quote unquote, Jared realizes a little too late that maybe Coda is not just going to go get cigarettes, but he comes back and he has two packs. So it seems like that is all we was doing. And this is when Hank comes in. Um, and Hank has basically had it with the fact that Coda has started drinking again and Hank and, uh, Maeve are both being really pushy about, getting this guy into rehab or something, which leads to a pretty brilliant moment with Maeve and Jared. Because later on, she says, I found some like, you know, gay friendly facilities that we could send him to. And we could really help him get back on track. And Jared responds with, have you ever heard of Al-Anon? It's for family of alcoholics. I know of a few meetings. We could look up the times and see what's best for you. I could even take you there and we could work on your issues together. And she stops and stares at him. And he says, that's how it feels to Coda. What I just did to you, making you feel like you're like a kid or a problem to be solved. That's how it feels. It's genius. Like straight up, Jared, that is genius. And she seems for a second to be really upset. 
But then she stops and when he says, I'm sorry, forget it. She says, no, you know what? I don't, I'm not mad at you. I'm just processing what you said. And I think you're right. I think I'm finally getting it. And I loved that so much. Loved it. Um, so yeah, I'm going to wrap this early here. Robin, I promise I will make it up to you with an extra 20 minutes on the next episode. I'm so sorry about this. I thought I could do it. Doesn't seem like it's the time. Um, but thank you guys all so much for being so patient. You're great. And, uh, I'm hoping that I will be better tomorrow. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Love of God. Thank you all again. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.